Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest episode of the Nordic Football Podcast. My name is Jonathan Faduba, and I'm delighted to be joined by a very special guest this week. We are joined by Kevin Nickel, who is the interim coach at Mjondalen at present. Um, and we're going to be talking about, obviously, life in Norway. We're going to be talking about coaching, you know, what it's like to be coaching at a club like this and, and, and working your way as a coach abroad um, and many other things. So I'm really excited to introduce our guest. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, how are you today? Yeah, I'm fine, Jonathan. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, and I look forward to talking about uh, life in Norway and, yeah, philosophy as a coach and how things are going at Mjondal. Yeah, it's been a sort of, it must be a bit of a hectic few um, weeks for you. Obviously, um, you know, the legendary coach, um, Vigar Henson, recently left his role. Uh, we, we talked about him on a recent podcast in terms of, I think he's one of the longest serving managers anywhere in European football, I believe, um, mm. until recently. And so obviously you've been working there with him and then he's left and you've kind of stepped up. So just, if you could just start by telling us, you know, how are you? It must have been a, it must have been a hectic few weeks for you. Yeah, it was a huge shock, actually. Um uh, the coaching staff knew, knew nothing about Vega leaving, to be honest, you know, and obviously the results were going quite poorly at the time. Um, I think we'd won around one game in the last 12 games. Um, but i never seen anything in his demeanour or his, you know, body language to suggest for one second that anything was going to happen, you know. Um, and he'd been uh, head coach here for 17 seasons. So, um, yeah, he is kind of Mr. Mjonda in many ways um, and done a fantastic job for the club. Um, I thought maybe towards the end of the season something might happen um, at the end of the season I should have said um, just because he'd been in the job for so long and things weren't, weren't going so well this year um, but it was a shock to see him leaving in the middle of the season I, I must be honest um, and the way it happened it happened you know, so quickly um, there was no warning um, and he said what he said in the, in the dressing room just before the training session so he handed me the session plan and uh, just walked out the door so yeah Obviously, at that time, it was a huge shock for not only myself and the coaching staff, but also the players. Um, uh, but from that, you know, I think, you know, football just moves on from day to day. You know, you know, there's always a game to be ready for. Um, there's always a training session to be a better team in. So um, from there, I think the players have been so professional in how they, how they dealt with the situation. Um, we've prepared really well for, for, for every game in the last five games. And um, it's actually went really well for us. Um, I think one in three and losing two is a, you know, quite fair from, from our, our our performances in many ways. And even the two games that we lost, I thought we did quite well. And so we, we've definitely improved in terms of um, how we're playing the game offensively and also defensively. I think we've been a little bit more proactive in how we, how we press. So, yeah, I think, you know, it's it's been difficult, um, but everyone's come together. And, and the one thing about this football club is, um, you know, it's very much a, a togetherness in everything we do. Um, we have a great spirit around the place. We've got a lot of volunteers who are very, very happy to work for the club, um, you know, just at their own time. Um, no one really gets paid a great deal of money here. It's quite a small club, so um, it's all about being together and things. And when bad things do happen, we've just got to keep it going and, and be there for each other, really. Um, and lucky that, you know, the coaching staff's been fantastic around me as well and supported me all the way. So, um, you know, I can't thank uh, everyone enough for, for all the support they've given me uh, for the first five weeks. And, um it's went well so far, yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk, you know, a bit about your career, and you know, you've you've had a storied career in, in Norway, which we're going to come on to in a minute. I just want to, you know, obviously, we, you know, Vigo Hansen has been there since two thousand and six. Um, so as I said, you know, he's, you know, that's a huge tenure in modern day football. I think. Um, what was it like, sort of, working with him, and you know, maybe what did he sort of teach you, or what did you learn from him in, in that period of time? Was there any tips that you've taken on as a manager? Because obviously, someone with that amount of experience it must be it must have been quite a, a nice learning curve to, to sort of work with someone like that and is that maybe yeah. what partly attracted you to to move to Mjondalen in, in the first place I, I believe you've been there since 2020. Yeah well actually I played under Vegar in 2009 um, when I played for Mjondalen so um, I had experience of him as a head coach as a player uh, first and foremost um, and we managed to stay up in the old Obos Liga which was called a Dekolug at the time um, we managed to stay up with um, a really, really small budget that year. Our squad was, you know, it wasn't the best squad in terms of player quality. Um, but as a player, you know, it just made you give that that extra 5-10%. Um, and I would have ran through a brick wall for Vegar, to be honest. Um, just his presence and how he built that team spirit and energy in the team was fantastic. Um, and I think that, that was what his success was based through, you know, was um, teams that worked super, super hard for each other. Um, 
and gave their all. So, so when I got my first uh, head coaching position in Asker, which is the second division in Norway, um, I tried to take all these things, you know, and how we how we built that uh, hard working mentality, how we built that, you know, playing for each other mentality. That you no, know, <laughs> some clubs there were some prima donnas. Of course, you always get a few players who maybe didn't want to do the job, you know, when it mattered. But uh, I've never felt that within Vegas team. I felt, you know, we've all got a squad of players that give absolute maximum every week. Um, and that's what I tried to take in my first coaching job, to be honest. Um, and he'd done a great job here, managing to get promotion from third division up to the second, then second to first, and then eventually up to lead the Serie. And so, you know, he was a very clever guy in terms of the defensive side also. You know, I think um, the main reason Mjorn Dahlen did stay up in the top league um, before he got relegated last year was it was so, so tough to beat, um, particularly against, you know, top teams who would go into tight low blocks, um, fantastic at defending the box. Um, and we were also dangerous at set pieces, especially in the earlier stage of, of Vegar's um, career here in Mjondan. He always had quite physical teams, uh, very, very very robust um, and could be very difficult to face because of very direct at times as well. So um, we've tried to adapt the style of football the last couple of years. And maybe in, in some senses, that was the reason you know, it never quite worked out. Um, I think Vegar is suited best as personality towards a more... Uh, cynical type type of football, even though his teams did play quite attractive at times. Um, I think that's more hard to beat mentality um, suits his way of playing, you know, and I think he, he built great success in Mjondan through that. Um, I remember before coming to the club in 2009, I thought I was quite a technical midfield player, you know, so I'd like to make passes, get on the ball. Um, but I was kind of moved away from my, my football style when I came here, you know. I, I don't think I'd ever tackled so much in one season, to be honest with you. you know, I was, I was always on the ground. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, but he managed to get the most out of me in terms of, you know, that work rate and that courage to, to get stuck in. Um, and I would, I would have done anything for him, to be honest. Um, and yeah, he's a role model for me, definitely, in, in terms of management. And, uh, you know, he managed to get so much out of people on such a small budget. Um, and both him and Kenny Carlson, you know, done a fantastic job at developing this football club to where it is today. Yeah, you mentioned kind of um, you know that the quote kind of you'd you'd run through a brick wall for him. Just wanted you know as a coach yourself, how do you what how, how do you sort of uh, build that kind of feeling among amongst the player? Like what was it that maybe he made you feel? Because you sometimes hear that with certain managers, you know that they they seem to get an extra level of commitment from a player. What what do you believe um, was the reason for that? Maybe with Vigard and and also yourself now as a coach yourself and maybe in your own management career, how do you sort of get that out of players if you know what I mean how do you f- form that bond where yeah. they're willing to maybe put in an extra 5% you, what, what's your thoughts on that well I think first and foremost a coach's actions has got to show that first you know so um, it, there's no point in me asking a player to give me everything unless I'm not willing to give everything in my daily work um, mm-hmm. and I think everyone knew around the club at the time that Vega worked super super hard you know he's, he's so dedicated he, he watches the opposition very very closely um, and he also looks after himself professionally as well in terms of keeping fit. So he was a good good role model in that sense. And I think that's very important. And it often gets overlooked in coaching. I think um, you as a head coach have got to set the standards in everything you do. Not yeah. not just um, what you're trying to tell the players, but how you live your life as well, you know. Um, and he was a role model in that sense. He was also in 2009, I think, at the age of 40. He was a player coach, you know, so he was still playing a little bit, he, I think. Yeah, I think he started the first game of the season in the, in the first division, actually, as a central defender for us against Songdao. Um, yeah, and he, he gave everything all the time, you know, so if, if he demonstrated that, then obviously the players have got to follow suit in some ways and it inspires you. Um, but I also think um, some coaches have got a certain way about them and the presence and also the, the passion that they convey um, when they're speaking to a group or just in their body language and how much they love the game of football, for example, it tends to get that extra little bit from people. Um, and hopefully I've got that myself. I've never experienced a team that didn't give them everything. Um, and yeah, it's a kind of non-negotiable thing, of course, that every coach says. But at the same time, some people have got a little bit of magic that they manage to get that extra 5% that, that makes all the difference at the end of the day. I think most coaches are quite evenly matched in the tactical sense. Um, but it's that interpersonal relationship um, in terms of talking to each individual a little bit differently, perhaps um, managing to find out how you know what makes each player tick a little bit. Mm. I think that often makes that you know 
that little difference between uh, a really good coach and maybe a not so good coach. So Faker had that in some senses, especially with the more experienced players. Um, he was able to create a close relationship with them. Um, he was able to develop a sense of trust, um, and that helped definitely. Um, but you have to be careful as a coach as well because I know that Vega he, he wanted to win so badly, like myself, mm. very similar personalities. Um, but I think I've managed to develop a, a self awareness over the last three, four years that sometimes the younger players you have to be a little bit careful um, and not put them under too much pressure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have a very young squad at the moment in Yondalan, so you have to adapt your approach slightly to them, allow them to make mistakes, um, yeah, and give them more support than maybe high demands. So it's a very fine balance that coaches must find. And uh, some, some head coaches are probably suited better to more experienced co- um, more experienced squads, I should say. And maybe others are more uh, suited to more of a like, younger group um, in terms of how they do their work. And I think maybe the secret is, is to be adaptable as a coach. And I've been quite fortunate to, to work as you know a player developer. Um, I've worked with you know, youth teams in the past. So I've got that you know knowledge that you know, I understand how how young players like to be given information and yeah. I probably understand how older players like it as well and I think that's quite important to, to consider. Yeah, for sure. It's really fascinating. I, I read um, a quote comment just recently from uh, Antonio Rudiger at Real Madrid and he said that um, when Carlo Ancelotti got the job he, he actually went to Rudiger's house for like two hours and sat down with him and had dinner with him and he said it's the first time in his career that a manager had ever sort of like been to his house and like really like asked him about his life and stuff like that and he said he couldn't believe it. Um, which just shows you maybe those little touches. Obviously, Ancelotti's a sort of legendary manager, but yeah, like you said, there maybe it's just like connecting with the player as well. And as you've mentioned, yeah. there kind of knowing how to how to deal with deal with players. I mean, mm. what um, you know, you've had a story career yourself in terms of you know you you you, you came you you what you played in Scotland, of course. Um, you know, you've played for teams like Hibernian um, and Wraith mm. Rovers, I believe, as well, and others, and yeah. then then kind of moved out to as you mentioned, you moved out to to Norway and um, played for Mjolnir and. Um, you also played at Strums Godset, I believe, and Moss, um, and then Asker, and then you became the the head coach of Asker as well. Um, yeah. Tell us about your journey from sort of Scotland. Like you mentioned there, you were kind of passing, and then suddenly you, you turn up in Norway, and you were sort of um, under under Vigard anyway, told not to not to pass it. And I know, I think we talked a lot about Mjolnir last season, for example, about the. You know, I think they scored 33 goals in 30 games and I think Steve, our, our, our Norway expert, kind of used to talk about the style of play a little bit and you know, trying to get more out of them. And I believe that you've kind of made comments that since you've taken the interim role, you, you've kind of tried, to, you've got a slightly different philosophy. I've read some interviews with you where you've talked about yeah. maybe having a more open philosophy. Um, so just tell us about how your playing career maybe shaped your role in management and, and you know, what made you want to go into management, yeah. if that makes sense. I was yeah I was I was really lucky as a player to play under really good coaches I must say you know I think um, when I started at Raith Rovers actually Terry Butcher and the coaching staff he was he was actually second team coach believe it or not Raith Rovers and I had Jimmy Nicholl as the head coach and I had Alex Smith as the assistant and Alex Alex had developed many many good young players through um, when he was manager at St Mirren and also Aberdeen um, and he was great with young lads Alex. And you had Jimmy Nicholl who played for Man United and Northern Ireland as well and had won the League Cup at Wraith Rovers, you know. So yeah. these guys were absolutely tremendous. And I remember one time with Terry, Terry Butcher came up to me and, you know, we talked about Graham Souness and how tough he was, how he, how he looked to dominate games and get on that ball. But he was also very tough physically, you know, and he said I was a little bit soft at the time, I was only 16. And he said, if you're going to be a top player, you need to learn, you know, to get stuck in a bit more and be a leader and dominate games and it's just these small things that you remember for people and uh, the way that Alex Smith uh, made you feel you know and I remember Jimmy he used to come to all the youth team games when I was only 16 at the time 17 and he would take each each player from the youth team into the home dressing room where he had a tactics board and he had he must have had like a a memory that just you know remembered everything you know from each he just remembered one or two things from the game from each individual and he took in that tactics board and he made you feel so important at the age of 16, you know, and, and this was the first team manager. Um, and I learned so much in that period. I mean, my debut when I was 17. Unfortunately, Jimmy left. Um, and we got another coach and, yeah, uh, I won't mention his name, but it's the only, only manager I've ever heard of that actually got sacked for bullying players. Oh, wow. So, so you could tell, so you could tell that the change in environment um, from a guy who was very much in the development, he wanted young players to play, and then another guy coming in, it was the old school Scottish mentality, very hard man type. Um, and it affected my career, to be honest with you. You know, I was, I was playing for Scotland at the time when I was 16, doing quite well, playing first team football. 
And then this other guy came in, and uh, I'm not making excuses or anything, but I definitely knocked my confidence, I must say, um, and knocked out the football in me a little bit. Um, you know, I was very expressive. I wanted to get on the ball, I wanted to show everybody how good player I was. And then that changed suddenly from uh, doing that to not taking any chances, um, to being hard working, you know, to kicking people. Yeah. Um, and that's from the age of 16, 17, that's still with me now. You know, I've, I've learned a lot from that and how your coach creates an environment and how he makes players feel safe, you know, and comfortable. So it's it's definitely, co coaching is definitely a little bit high demand, you know, and it's very important you get your ideas in place. But at the same time, um, you know, you have to support players, even older ones. You know, they've got so much pressure on them nowadays from social media. They get ratings in the newspaper and websites all the time about how, they, how well they play. Um, so if coaches aren't able to create that kind of psychologically safe environment to a certain extent, it can't always be totally safe in football because there's competition. Then it's, it's you're not going to get the best of your players, you know. So anyway, after that period in the Wraith Rovers, I was lucky enough to move to Hibs. Um, and again, I worked under a top manager for maybe, I think it was five, six months that Alex McLeish was there when I was first there. Um, his presence was tremendous. You know, he walked in a room, uh, Alex, and, you know, you could just tell he was he was knowledgeable, but he just, he just had full control and everything he did, you know. Um, and he obviously moved to, to be working in the Premiership, I think, and Scotland national team manager. Um, learned a lot there in terms of demands and what, and what was expected from you. Um but it never quite worked out for my Hibs. Uh, Frank Sose signed me, a legend of the club. He unfortunately got sacked um, two months later, I think, after he signed me. Um, and then Bobby Williamson came in and, you know, he preferred other players and it was an international players at the time, so it was very difficult for me to break through. Um, and when I became to the age 22, roughly 23, there was other young players coming through that were 18, 19, that were absolutely fantastic. Scott Brown, Kevin Thompson, and these other guys really, you know... Yeah were steps ahead of me but interestingly um, Tony Mowbray was the, the the next manager at Hibs and um, he was obviously fantastic in terms of developing a way of playing uh, I learned so much from him on, on uh, you know playing through the thirds he came through the Ipswich um, system that was you know very very nice football they played there um, and he he kind of refined a lot of these younger guys into better footballers you know Thompson Brown were even better when he walked in so um, well at the time I broke my foot so um, um, I was out for eight months. It, it happened twice. It was a stress fracture first, and I, I broke my foot again. And I was coming back to fitness around the summertime. It was around May time actually. Um, so he suggested I go across to Scandinavia to, to you know, to get football, first team football. Um, and it was just uh, through coincidence I ended up in Strömsgötse, um, uh, which is not too far from where I am now. It's ten minutes down the road, and I played there alone. You know, for the first. Um, yeah, for the first three months or so, went really well. Um, and extended that low move into the end of the season. Unfortunately, I picked up an injury, which never quite worked out. Um, so I had, I had that actually in my eyes set on staying in Norway. I really enjoyed it um, from day one. The culture was fantastic. Um, met a lot of lovely people, nice people. Um, didn't mind the football, it was okay. Um, yeah, and I wanted to stay here a little bit longer, you know, but that never worked out. So I went back to Scotland and played in Peterhead, a small club there. Really enjoyed that as well, but... It's, it's interesting how things work out in life. You know, I had a I had a teammate that moved to a club called Haugesund. Yeah. Um, in the top league. Um, he gave me a phone call in the, in the close season, actually, summertime there in 2006 and said, um, Haugesund are looking for a central midfielder. So, yeah, I just went across on trial and uh, I had an offer waiting from Partick Thistle in the first division in Scotland. Um, so I had that in case anything never worked out. Uh, but we played a trial match against Rosenberg at Ler- Lerkendal and I played really, really well. Um, and from, from there, I was, you know, signed a two and a half year contract and I've been in Norway since. Um, next club was Mjondal and Vega. And from there, you know, I think you get a name in, in the country you're in. People in Scotland tend, tend to lose touch. And I was never a big player in Scotland either. So it was always difficult for me to find a club going back there, you know. Um, and things just continued. And now I've been there for 15, 16 years. Um, yeah, my wife came over with me. I was engaged at the time, a Scottish Scottish girl. Um, so we've lived here together and we've got two kids who who don't know nothing else apart from the Norwegian language. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. They obviously speak a, bit, speak a bit Scottish when they speak English <laughs> and they've got perfect Norwegian. So, Amazing. yeah, so, you know, I'm so lucky, I must say. I'm, yeah. uh, I've been so fortunate that things have worked out well for me in my career and met so many good people. I live in Drammen, yeah. uh, which is the place yeah. I first came to 15 years ago. So, uh, yeah. It's yeah, been we, a great always, job. we always say on the podcast that it's like a fantastic football country, really, like Norway and Sweden, you know, and the Scandinavian in general. 
Um, mm. And yeah, it's really nice that you found sort of a life out there and kind of forged a career. I mean, you you were in charge of player development um, at uh, your, your 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 previous role, I believe. Um, and in your kind of first few games at Mjondaland, I believe you you were in charge since the August twenty second, I think. Um, yeah. and you've actually won three out of five games, yeah. uh, I believe. So your most recent result beat stood out Blink two one. Uh, Skid, I think hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, 1-0, um, and also beat Sanders all 4-1. Um, yeah. I believe, like, according to sort of like, you know, the games we've watched and, and, and what we've looked into, you kind of slightly tweaked the for- formation a little bit. Um, mm. Just tell us about kind of player development, because I believe like um, Yondan have one of the sort of younger teams in, in the Obos, and yeah. you're kind of maybe trying to bring in this kind of new style uh, of, of play. Mm. We have like a, a partnership with Wisecout, and according to them, um, you're sort of one of the younger teams in in the division, average age, um, twenty five point eight, I think, which is you know lower lower mid table in terms of um, you know one of the youngest teams, if that makes sense, or the younger yeah, team. Yeah. Just tell me about kind of player development and what you've learned in your career in your previous role, and then sort of going into more of a management role where you're in charge um, here as well. What you know, yeah. what kind of how that's helped you maybe work with these younger players that are at Mundan because they've got some quite exciting players, haven't they? Yeah, we have, and we're really fortunate uh, to have so many good young players. Actually, we've got maybe five, six that are around the first team. Maybe yeah, maybe five, six are actually starting matches. It just depends on how you define a young player. Um, you know, we've actually got quite a few around the ages of twenty, twenty-one. Yeah. Um, yeah. But for me, uh, that's not that young. You know, I think. Yeah, for sure. Sometimes we underestimate young players. To be honest with you, um, and we are looking to even get them into the team at an earlier age. You know, we've got. Got maybe a, yeah, we've had three 16 year olds that have made a debut this year, um, which has been great for the club. Um, yeah, and, and we hope to continue this. I think it's been a change of strategy from the club, to be honest, John, Jonathan. I think, um, in the past it was all about winning football matches, um, staying up in the lead of setting, uh, but we knew from the from that model it wasn't feasible when we weren't selling enough players, you know. Um, and to sell players, you have to introduce young players into the team. Um, sure. you know, we've got we've got an academy that's working really well as well. So yeah, it's a kind of change of strategy, and I've been very used to working with young players. And I think I think the main thing when you work with young players is to give them a permission to make mistakes. Um, nobody wants to make mistakes. You know, I've not, never met a, pe- a person in the world that wants to make a mistake. But unless you make that safe for a young player, and as long as they're not careless, if they are careless, then, then that's the first thing they'll hear from me. You know, that's not good enough. And uh, like I've said before, the, the demands are always high. But that support is very, very important for young players. Um, and they get a feeling from from everybody, I think. You know, it's just like having kids as well at the same time. Um, you can't be on kids' back all the time because they'll never learn. You must learn to take responsibility. You know, you must you must give them little bits of advice. You must give them value. You must teach them. So for me, part of my job uh, for the last, you know, five games and for the next five games is to continue to teach them players and uh, we've got so much potential in the group. And I must say, I've got some great experienced players as well, such as uh, Olam and Sven, who helps me around, you know, so much in terms of helping these young guys. Because as a coaching staff, there's maybe, you know, we've got maybe three or four of us around the team. But we also need the experienced players that set the standards every day, uh, talk to these young guys in a way that they can, uh, yeah. So I've, I've tried to develop an environment where um, the, the players all feel related to each other. Um, they feel as though they've got a certain amount of freedom into how we play um, I'm very very tough on the guidelines and what I want to see in terms of offensive and defensive side of things but at the same time I'm very very open for player input I think that's extremely important to create you know, motivation um, and also there's a way of giving information that helps players from a coach um, if you're not going to give a reason why then it's not going to help a player learn You know, so um, I'm very very keen on um, telling the players exactly why I'm doing a certain thing and why I'm thinking about a certain thing and trying to get them involved in the process. Um, and this is more a modern way of doing things rather than the... So, so far, it's worked very, very good. And I think, you know, we've played much better football. I think, um, yeah, I think we're passing it better, I would say. And we're going to the thirds a little bit better. And we're finding those spaces that I look to look to use as much as possible offensively. You know, we've, we've changed the formation to a 4-3-3. Um, and it's very flexible, 4-3-3. Um, it's not, I think, in the past, Norwegian teams are very rigid in how they played 4-3-3, you know, from, from the Rosenborg days. But I think the modern game now is much more flexible in terms of the tactics you use. Um, and it's all about people being in the right spaces at the right time, depending on what the opposition do. Um, so, yeah, we play a 4-3-3, but at the same time, that formation changes a lot when we have the ball. Um, 
And uh, yeah, I think it's went very, very well so far. Um, I think the area we need to improve on the most is actually in terms of pressing. Um, it's something that's very close to my heart to be a high pressing team. Um, and that's probably, you know, to get that positional pressing just perfect, it takes a lot of work on the training pitch and that's still a working process. Um, I think the performances has been a step up from uh, mid-season where we, you know, we dipped quite a bit. Yeah, for sure. I've read, I've read some interviews with you where you said kind of um, that you, you know, you want to play an aggressive, maybe high line and also a good sort of passing game, play through the thirds, if you know what I mean, kind of a modern style. Um, yeah. I wondered how, because I'd, I'd like to know a bit more about the structure of Mion Dallin, because from my understanding, it's part-time or kind of a hybrid model, I guess, of, of, of um, as a football club. Could you just tell me a little bit more about that and how it works? Because I think we used to discuss it when you were in, obviously, Elita Serian on the pod, and I found it incredible to think that you were competing at, you know, um, Elita Serian level for so long. But yeah. I don't quite maybe understand the, you know, what part-time means, I guess, in Norway. Is it the same as England, maybe, where you have you train twice a yeah. week or whatever? Well, Can you just tell us a bit more about the club itself yeah. and the structure? Yeah, we're actually full-time now. Right. Um, that was taken maybe, you know, maybe three or four years ago. Right. Yeah, so, so we train at 11 o'clock. So, so all the players are full-time. Um, I'm full-time, obviously. Um, but we do have, within the coaching staff, we have a physio who's basically full-time but still works on the side. Mm. Uh, so he's got his own physio practice. Uh, we've got an assistant who's coming to help me, who is, uh, yeah, part-time, but he's here every day. He's got another job he goes to later on right. in the day. Um, the goalkeeping coach works full time with Alag, the, the, the first team, sorry. And uh, he also works in the academy, though, to make up his salary. So he maybe does an extra three, four sessions a week, works so hard. Um, our fitness coach is, is part time, so he comes in around three, four days a week, not every day. Um, on the main days that we train hard, you know, so he's, we've got GPS, obviously, and he looks at that closely. Um, so we don't have a, a pure full-time model within the coaching staff, but it's basically full-time. Um, and all, all the players are full-time. So, yeah, often, you know, we train twice twice a day, not, not football as such, but we also have a strength session um, two or three times a week after the football session every day. Um, so, so yeah, I think I think we train as, as much as any other club, really. But it's very interesting, down, down the levels in Norway, uh, in the third level, second division, most teams are part-time, but... It's totally different. We, you know, train still train five six times a week, even though they call it part time. So, it's a different model than maybe Scotland or England, where you call part time training twice a week in March, obviously. Um, so it's much more development orientated. And um, I had an assistant with me, and Asker Ian Murray, who's now the Wraith Rovers manager, um, and he's tried to take some of these ideas back to Scotland, and um, that the boys train more, you know, at least at least three four times a week rather than training twice in part time clubs. Um, but it is, it is hard to change these uh, these attitudes or mentalities from, from before, you know. You, you said that in the past, you um, <clears throat> well, I mean, in terms of your education, you know, I think you've educated yourself, haven't you? You're, you're a young coach. Uh, I believe you've got a master's degree in performance coaching. Um, so you're clearly, like, dedicated to your role. Like, what, um, I wondered, you know, how you see it developing from here. Like, I don't know, if, is there any discussions to maybe make it permanent uh, with Mundell? I don't know if you're allowed to say, but in terms of... Um, just wanted to ask you in terms of the side of, you know, you mentioned in terms of performance coaching and, and developing players, which is something clearly quite uh, dear to you. Do, do you think that in Norway, because there's a lot of obviously talk about Norway with Haaland and others kind of coming through, Patrick Berg, um, you know, Glimp, for example, are becoming like a bit of a beacon in Norway now with the results they've had and doing so well. I just wondered if you could t- sort of tell us a little bit more about the the environment and the culture in Norway of, of sort of player development, because it seems like maybe there's a few things they're getting right at the moment that may, you know, maybe people are starting to look towards. Um, what's it like being in that environment? Academy classifying, it's called. It's maybe the academy classification. Um, each each top club gets uh, stars based on how well, well they perform in terms of um, players that play first team minutes. Right. Uh, it depends on uh, how many coaches full time they have within their academy, um, and they give they give every club ratings. And the higher rating you have, or the higher how many stars you have, the more money you get for your football club. Oh, wow. um, so this has been a fantastic model, you know, to, to push clubs to develop things, to what, push clubs to play on players. What, just out of interest, sorry, what, do you, what are those ratings based on? Do you know, like, is it kind of, uh, I don't know, minutes played or... Yeah, do, minutes do you know, played, yeah. also quality of coaches they have, um, also um, how many coaches they have and fitness coaches and physios. Right. Um, yeah, many different, you know, ratings. I, I'm not even sure if if it's taken into account um, how much money they make actually from selling players. Mm. Um, but but it's fantastic, I think. And, and every club gets, you know, 
um, looked at over a, a yearly basis, I think, or maybe over two years, how well they're doing. Um, and, and how well you do determines how much money you get. And so it's a great, you know, carrot, for example, how, you know, if you do really well, then yeah. and if you play young players, then you actually get more money. And so um, it's been a fantastic move for the whole of um, football in Norway. And, and we've got great facilities over here as well. Every town has got their own artificial grass relay, which is not locked up, which, you know, kids can go and just play on and uh, play with their friends from morning to evening. And uh, when the weather's fine, obviously, it gets very cold in the winter. Um, but but these 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 little small things and the quality of coaching as well I think has developed a great deal um, since I've been here and um, the ideas way of playing we've changed from a very direct style of football to more um, I wouldn't say possession oriented but more proactive modern style playing to the thirds um, better technical footballers so it's been a great change and and the typical Norwegian player when I grew up was a very physical player. Um, I thought about long balls, drill football, you know, and thinking about the Norwegian teams from the World Cups in the past. Um, but now things have changed, you know, they've got some of the best players in the world when you look at Raut Holland and Martin Odegaard. So uh, I think Norway national team, if they find, if they've got good enough central defenders, um, good enough goalkeeper, then it could be a very, very exciting team, you know, I think they could actually get close to winning a, a European trophy, maybe. So, um, or a, a world, you know, a trophy on the, the world stage and uh, against other nations because they've got a very, very good team and a good manager now in Sobak. And so, yeah, it's exciting times for, for Norwegian football, I must say. Yeah, that's really, really yeah, fascinating. Really thanks great. thanks for giving some insight into that. In, in terms of Mjondal, obviously, you know, are there any players that you kind of, at the moment, um, are kind of, that you said, you know, you, uh, there's a lot of young players there and, and you know, could name one or two. I mean, I'd just be interested to know a bit more about maybe some of the players there. That you think have, have really developed this season, or are developing through maybe the academy and and, and the U team, because that's an area that you you seem quite uh, keen on and focused on, isn't it? In developing the players, is that is that the model maybe at Mjolnir to maybe develop and, and maybe sell on and kind of make a profit um, in that sense? Um, yeah, as the, the, the model, Jonathan. But at the same time, we want we want to go back up to Lita Yeah, um, and I think it's possible. I really do. So yeah, we want to develop young players, but at the same time. Um, there's always going to be three or four experienced players that must you know, set the standard and they must be good enough to take us to the next level so player recruitment I think is the most important thing in football mm. um, and if we get the right experienced players in, um, and surround them with our good young players I think that can be a, a very good recipe for success to be honest um, I love working with young players and all the top clubs in the past like the Man United and all that you know, they've all been based on uh, really good youth players coming through the, you know, the the system, yeah. you, know, you always get that extra little bit of enthusiasm and desire from a player that's came all the way from the age of 13 through an academy, like uh, Seaver Scott Eriksson, for example. Um, he's a young lad that came right from day one in, in the Mjöndalen Academy, and he's maybe been the first one to take that step to playing regular first-team football from, you know, coming to the club from the age of 13, which is a great story. Yeah. Um, but we've got other young guys in the team, such as uh, Adrian Hansen, Vegar's son, yeah, he's played really well the last couple of games. He was in another local club before he came to Mjöndal at the age of um, maybe 18, 19 or so. Um, a central defender, a great future, um, good physical presence and a, a good passing foot. Um, and we've got a left-back, Siever Doverby. Uh, he came a little bit later, so he's not come through the academy, but we signed up from a, a third division club um, in Bergen. Um, but he's uh, grew up in Honifoss, which is a club not far away from here. He used to be the top. Um, he's doing very well as well. Good gives a lot of assists from the left back position and um, really good high speed running stats. So he's one for the future as well. Um, and we've got yeah, we've got young Brinder Singh who scored last week against um, Sherdar's Blink. Young winger or a striker. Um, really good speed, good technical skills one v one. So he's another one to look out for. And there's many actually. You know, I, I don't like mentioning individuals since you asked to mention a few, um, but we've got really good ones uh, through the club. You know, we've got. We've got three 16-year-olds that um, have all been involved in the national team. Um, we've got another player midfield called Eric Schiester. He's as good technically as any player, you know, his age going about. You know, I think uh, Schiester's got a huge future if he manages to keep himself fit and uh, get regular games under his belt, you know, and, and be me even more effective um, in an offensive sense going forward. So um, I'm so fortunate to work with so many young guys that are so dedicated um, and have given everything to the football club and... Uh, yeah, I think the football we're going to play is only going to get better, and uh, I think they're fully, fully into the process. I started. They like to be more uh, proactive, and they like to be more uh, dominant in terms of us, us trying to control games. 
Um, and so far it's went very good. I believe one match we've had less possession than all possession. That was shied at home. Um, and that was basically because we used so much energy in the first half with pressing and it never quite worked out. Um, that we, were, you know, we we got a little bit low second half. Um, never never had the energy to play, you know, really. But um, but they're giving me so much and the, the high speed running stats and all that. We're, we're super high compared to what we were before. So things are going very well, and uh, these young guys are only going to get better in a proactive, positive environment. Before I let you go, just um, finally, like, what's the sort of maybe future for, for yourself? As I mentioned, you know, you're a young coach. You, you seem to have a real great body of experience. Um, do you? Has there been any conversations about past the end of this season, or is there kind of is it kind of on, on the back burner at the moment? And it sounds like you're quite settled in Norway. Do you, do you have ambitions to maybe, like you mentioned there, the aims to get back to Elite Serie, and I imagine that's the the priority <laughs> at this moment in time. But you know, where do you see things developing from your point of view? Is there anything that you're working on maybe, you know, in terms of qualifications or anything like that? Like, just interested to know yeah. a bit more about yourself. You know, I'm sure we'll maybe see you a bit more in the, in the years to come as well on this podcast yeah. and, and at least Yeah, well, one of the reasons I took the master's degree was because um, I'd already done the, all, all the UEFA coaching licences, you know, I've been very fortunate to get my UEFA pro quite early, you know, I've got that done when I was 34 years old uh, in Scotland through the SFA. Um, took the master's degree the last couple of years um, and that was so so good you know in terms of uh, being better from a pedagogical sense you know in terms of teaching um, I learned so much from um, many other coaches working in other sports um, so the education side and the development side I think I've covered that quite well up to now um, but there's always more to learn you know I, I read all the time listen to podcasts um, so many good coaches out there I love watching other, other coaches uh, take sessions for example um, and I hope to find other courses I can go on, you know, maybe from a more management sense, perhaps. Um, these are all things to think about in the future. Um, but obviously, being a head coach, you, you know, you've got a very busy busy day. Um, so, yeah, I hope things continue the way they are just now. Um, I'm really enjoying the role I'm in. Um, and I'm sure over the next few weeks, we'll have discussions with the board um, and see how they want to take things going forward. Um but if it's not going to be here, obviously, find another club in Norway um, would be ideal at the moment uh, with, with my family being here. Um, yeah, and I think it's important to be ambitious in life. I think um, I don't think I would want to just stay in Norway the rest of my life. You know, I'm, I'm very much in there finding out new experiences, meeting new people after living in a different country uh, from the one I was growing up in. So, you know, it doesn't scare me taking that step to another country. Um, and the kids are now 13 and 9 years old so certainly maybe 6, 7, 8 years down the line and I would love to experience something else um, and I think there's always things to pick up from different cultures and um, it'd be very good as a coach to see if I manage to adapt myself to, to that lifestyle or that way of playing um, and there's also, yeah, like I said, so many clever people to take things from and uh, I've been so fortunate in my career to work under good uh, coaches and also alongside good coaches that have given me a lot of inspiration um, and I'm always getting better as a coach so development development never stops I think it's a, a daily thing and uh, each day you try and make it a masterpiece as John Wooden said um, give it your best and uh, at the end of the day I'm no, very very privileged to be in a, a really good position I feel as though I'm working for the people in Yonder and you know it's a small village only 8,000 people uh, but the football club here is so important so to give them 100% every day is, is, uh, is everything for me at the moment. Just wanted to get like one final very quick question, like three sort of coaching mentors maybe that you could name, like it could be people that you've not met or that you've maybe been to watch training or worked with, just, inter- just out of interest, you know, three maybe inspirations um, that have helped you along your journey, if you could maybe... Yeah, um, I, don't know. I don't know about watching coaches. Um, I would say John Wooden from reading his books mm. is the, the man that's probably... Um, yeah, give me so much inspiration how he creates an environment of learning and improving first and foremost um, there's also a guy called Bill Walsh I'm, I'm not sure if you heard of him, an American football coach who wrote a book called The Score Takes Care of Itself okay. um, that's a book I recommend every coach reads Bill Walsh, American football San Francisco 49ers head coach, really good book um, any of John Wooden's stuff read that, superb and the last guy I would say is Phil Jackson, um, who yeah. Yeah. was head coach of Chicago Bulls, Chicago Bulls obviously, and um, early Lakers. And he's got a book called uh, Sacred Hoops, which is a little bit different. It's uh, a little bit more uh, spiritual based, but um, I just like his ideas and uh, yeah, very, very, very different. He had the courage uh, to talk about meditation and uh, body-mind connection before anyone was really talking about these things. And um, 
I think that's the next step maybe in football management, you know, and uh, yeah, I think we need to look at developing the whole person more rather than just uh, winning football matches and that's what I intend to do here and if you manage to develop the person and give value, then I think the results will take care of itself at the end of the day. Well, that's a great place to leave it and I've really enjoyed talking to you, it's fascinating and um, maybe some advice there for coaches as well, some books to look into. So, Kevin Nicholl, thank you so much for your time. Um, it's been really great to talk to you on the Nordic Football Podcast and uh, we really wish you all the best for the rest of the season and, and obviously beyond, we'll, we'll be keeping a close eye on your career development. So, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jonathan. Pleasure. That was Kevin Nicholl on the Nordic Football Podcast. Thank you very much for your time, Kevin, and we wish you the very best of luck for the rest of this season. You can follow Kevin on Twitter at KevNickNIC6. And, of course, you can follow uh, Mjern Down on uh, Twitter as well at MIF Top Football. So uh, do check out those socials. Do check out our socials as well at Nordic Foot Pod. You can follow Jonathan at JF Football and myself, Steve Wiss at Meatman Soccer. Hope you enjoyed the episode. We'll be back for more soon. Thanks once again to Kevin. Take care and see you around, everyone. Goodbye.